I'm going to talk about the question that many people have. Namely, can robots be made creative in some sort of way, creative enough that they could develop their own language? And uh, I have here a few terms like attention, awareness, self, empathy, intersubjectivity, meaning, creativity, insight, language. These are all words that we use to describe something that our mind can do and something that is very mysterious like awareness or meaning and so philosophers of course have written many books about it and they thought about it but there is an unusually new way to investigate these questions which is by building technical systems uh, these can be computer systems, but they can also be uh, robots like this one, in which we can actually investigate these questions by building models. And let me show you an example here. Um, this is of a, a robot, this is the Curio robot, which was built by Sony like five, seven years ago. It's a small humanoid robot, but which is amazingly sophisticated in terms of computing power, in terms of the memory that it has. It has, of course, uh, visual capabilities. It has sensors. And many people would ask, well, why, why do you have these robots? What's the use of it? But for us, one of the interesting things you can do with these robots is to investigate these aspects of the human mind, you know, like awareness and creativity that I was mentioning. Now, in this case, uh, this is an experiment in which we put the robot in such a way that it can actually look at itself. So it's looking at its hand, and this is what you see, uh, well, what the robot is seeing in, in the left-hand corner. And you also see an internal simulation that the robot has, so that it's actually making a model of itself, of its, of its body, and looking at its hand, and that way trying to relate how its body is moving, how it is um, experiencing its body, how it can see its body at the same time as it is uh, moving about. So this is an experiment to explore, for example, what does it mean to have a self? You know, at what point can you say that you are aware of your own body or that you know your own body? So this is just one of the experiments that, that we've been doing, fascinating experiments. But today I want to talk about uh, a more cognitive or mental uh, capacity, which is related to language. And, you know, when, when we think about what is unique to humans, then there's one thing which stands out, which is that we have this ability to create representations. Now, what you see here on the uh, image is a very old drawing. Uh, it's actually 35,000 years old and was discovered in one of the caves in the south of France, a cave in uh, Lascaux. And so when you look at this picture, it is very amazing because it's kind of uh, not really a realistic uh, image of, a, of an animal. But it's a, it's a representation in the sense that it is actually trying to represent the meaning that uh, humans at that time had about this animal. So it looks a little bit like a human, the, you know, the, the, the paws have a little bit hands and the, the feet also look like feet of a human. And it's a sort of a mixture of human and animal because it's related to the religious uh, experiences that um, the early humans had when they were living in these caves, when they were making these drawings. And so representation making is, is really something that is very old, uh, it's something that is unique to us, or something that is very important. And so we want to understand actually why we make representations, how we make representations, how you learn to do that. And language is, of course, one form of representation making. But it's sort of interesting to look at uh, drawings and images because it's, it's more visible, so it helps us to see what it is. Now, the key actually is that there's a, 
a sort of interaction between making meaning and making representations. And meaning is another kind of mental term that we use a lot to talk about ourselves. But meaning here, I will take it that it's about making distinctions. It's a distinction which is relevant to us, then we say that it is meaningful. For example, about red and green is meaningful with a traffic light. And so that way, you know, it, it, it is relevant for our interaction with the environment. And the representation is a way to make these meanings visible or to make them in language, to make them symbolically, uh, well, explicit so that they can be exchanged, that they can be uh, absorbed by other people. Now, if you look at the evolution of a human, you know, you see that already at a very early age, uh, children, they start to make these, these kind of scribbles, which is like uh, babbling. You know, they make marks on a piece of paper, and of course they start babbling like ba, 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 ba. And this is a way to explore the medium of representation. At that point, well, we think that, that the sounds or the scribbles on a piece of paper, they don't yet have meaning, but the children are already learning to, to, uh, to gain control of their movements and to gain control of the way to, to, to represent, actually. But it's, it's just a meaning. But then very soon, like from year three or year four, they start, uh, children start making already these drawings. Like this is a drawing of uh, machines that the child of four years old has made. And you see many machines interposed on each other. It's not a realistic drawing, but it's kind of the concepts and the, the meanings that the child has about machine are being represented. And here you, you can see, for example, the incredible creativity that children already have at a young age. Uh, this is from a child who is trying to draw a horse. And on the left side, you know, this is on the front of a piece of paper. And the child draws the, the horse. And, but, but the child wants to give some 3D uh, representation because there are four uh, legs. So it is trying to, to see how, co how could it make perspective. Of course, the child doesn't know yet how to make perspective. And then what the child d did in this case is to turn the page around and draw the other legs on the other side of the piece of paper. And then when you hold it up, you know, it gives a kind of image of 3D perspective. So this is just to show that already at a very young age, this amazing creativity that humans have in making representations and the same is true for language, actually, because this is a, a sentence that a child has made uh, of uh, four years old also. You know, my mommy, my house, a play, ball. So these, these words are concatenated. They are not like nice, uh, complete phrases, but it's also like uh, images, like in these drawings, you know, that are put together in order to represent a certain desire or to describe a scene that is already there. So there are lots of relations between making drawings and uh, beginning to use language. And then, of course, uh, when, when language goes on, you know, it remains a very creative activity. I mean, here is a, a little cartoon. It says, it works, sir. We bored them right out of the game. So here, bored is usually not a verb. Well, it's certainly not uh, a verb that can be used to cause something else. And so what happened in this phrase is that the one who formulated it, you know, used the, the language in a creative way to, to kind of, uh, you know, twist so that something could be expressed, even if it was not according to the rules of the language. So this is the kind of thing that I'm interested in. How is it possible that people can make these representations? Uh, how can they create meanings? How can they um, you know, express them? How can we transmit also ways in which these meanings can be conveyed? Now, how can we do this? And so the first idea is that we are going to create a setup in which we have two robots because language at least involves uh, two, uh, a speaker and a hearer. So if you want to do an experiment, well, we need at least two robots. 
So we, we put them together, we put them in a particular environment, uh, for example, an environment like this one here, where you have various kinds of blocks and you have uh, uh, two robots which can act as speaker and as hearer. So we put them in, in this kind of environment and then we let the robots play language games. And a language game is an interaction that may involve some action in the world like pointing or picking up an object or doing a certain kind of movement. And um, it also involves a little bit of language. And it may, for example, be, uh, could you give me the blue block? Okay, and then this is what the speaker is saying. And then the hearer is going to uh, pick up the block or show the, the block in a way to respond to the request for, um, for an action. So here is uh, an example of an interaction. And um, so you see in, in the beginning the robots are looking around. They're trying to observe the scene. And one of the robots is going to be the speaker. Uh, you will see it because the, the green color of the head is lighting up. So he's the speaker and he says, Bolima. Now the other robot is looking around and points to the object that he believes is Bolima. Now the speaker looks to see whether this is indeed the object that he intended and he says, no, no, this is not Bolima. And now he's pointing to the object that he thinks, well, that he, he thinks that it should have been. So in this case, the yellow block. And this gives the hearer, who didn't know the word, the opportunity to learn it. So you see, it's an interaction between the speaker and the hearer about objects in the world. They use pointing gestures and they use language, but the language uh, may fail. In particular, it may be uh, the speaker may use a word that the hearer doesn't know yet. And so in that case, the game and the context is restricted enough so that uh, the, the listener can pick up the word that the speaker uh, had been using. I will now show uh, another game. So in this game, let's look at the uh, at underneath the system because what you see here is what uh, one agent is seeing and here you see what the other robot is seeing. And this is the representation internal model that the robots are building of their world as they are playing this kind of game. And you see it's another game and now uh, he has said Bolima and the speaker, uh, sorry, the hearer has then pointed to this object and he's now saying, yes, this is Bolima. So this is an example of a successful game. So this is a language game and um, we can play many of these kinds of games. And in that context, we can study, in fact, the how uh, communication is going, but we can also study how new words may be invented, this creativity that I was talking about and that we, that we see in children, we can investigate them within the context of such a game. And let's first look at what is involved uh, in, in playing such a game. Basically, uh, let's first look at the speaker. And so there are two parts of it. Okay, there's first of all a process that we call conceptualization. And this means to look at the world and to categorize the world. That means to put objects in, uh, in certain classes or identify certain properties that are going to be useful to talk about these objects or to talk about these actions. So conceptualization is, is a process of selecting uh, what you want to say, the meaning that you want to convey. And then there's a second process which is called expression or production, which is to take this meaning and then transform it in terms of the words and the grammatical constructions of a particular language. So this is what the speaker is doing, thinking about what to say and then saying it. Now the hearer goes through a kind of the reverse of this process, because what the hearer has to do when he hears an, a sentence, an utterance, is first to parse, that means to uh, look up the words in, the, in his own vocabulary, trying to 
recover, in fact, the meaning that is present. And once he has been able to parse the sentence, to see its uh, grammatical structure, to see the words that are in it, it is then necessary for the hearer to interpret the meaning back into the world. So you have these two kinds of uh, activities, conceptualization and expression for the speaker, and then interpretation and parsing for the hearer. Now, the interesting thing is that this can go on when the speaker has already a number of concepts and has already a vocabulary and a grammar, and the hearer has similar concepts, a similar grammar, and so they can play this kind of game, you know, using their inventories in a routine way. But it becomes really interesting when uh, one of these processes is failing. For example, it's possible that the hearer, uh, sorry, the speaker wants to uh, categorize the object, wants to find a property of this object which would be useful in communication, but doesn't find that yet. And in that case, well, the speaker could invent a new category, invent a new concept. Now, this may sound strange, but actually the invention is like cutting up the world in a new way so that you may be able to talk about it. For example, you might not have yet a distinction between blue and green. You know, it's all kind of one color for you. But when you are forced to talk about green and blue objects, well, then it's useful to make these distinctions. And so it's useful to come up with two different categories. So you see that making, uh, well, talking is a way that you create new categories, you could create new meanings. Now, for expression also, it may be that you don't have a word yet or you don't have a grammatical construction yet that is allowing you as a speaker to say what you mean. And in that case also, you can stretch the language, you can invent a new word, you know, you can use an existing word with a new kind of meaning and that way, actually, the language is expanding and is, uh, uh, the vocabulary of the language can be increased for the speaker. On the side of the hearer, also, things may go wrong. For example, when the hearer is parsing the sentence, well, it may be that he doesn't know a word. Or it may be that he doesn't know this grammatical construction or finds it odd. And so it may be that the hearer is not able to actually interpret the sentence that has been transmitted. Now, in that case, the hearer may, may say, I don't know. And then the speaker could give feedback, like pointing, which you saw in the video clip. You know, the, the robot acting as speaker could do the action or point or show the object. And in that way, the hearer might grasp the meaning, might reconstruct the meaning that the speaker had in mind. So this is a way in which the hearer can actually uh, not only learn the word that's being used by a speaker, which he didn't know yet, but also the hearer may acquire new meanings, new categories, new concepts, um, in order to be able to make sense of what the speaker was saying. So uh, now what we're going to do is to implement all this stuff on a robot. And basically, we give uh, our robot, we give it a strategy. And the strategy is first a way to play the game, uh, assuming that you already know the words, you already know categories. So what the speaker has to do is, first of all, to choose a topic. For example, there may be several objects on the table, and the speaker chooses one, uh, one object, you know, or like the robot, there were the blue and green and yellow objects, so the speaker selects one of them. Then the speaker is going to try and find a property of this object which distinguishes it from the other objects in the context. So if we look at the, at the scene again, you know, we look at this example, and so suppose that the speaker has selected this particular object, well, this object is yellow and the other objects are of another color, so yellow might be a good property to convey. On the other hand, uh, we have here a block which is lying and the others are all standing. So if we want to talk about this object, 
we might say it's orange, but we might also say it's light. Or we might say it's the object closest to me. So there are many different possibilities in which the same uh, object can be talked about. So the speaker finds a distinctive category and then looks up in his lexicon which word uh, expresses that particular category and then the, the, the speaker, the robot who is speaker, will then produce it. Now the here goes through this reverse process. So the here, uh, the robot who is here, will first look up the word in his own vocabulary because there's no telepathy or direct global knowledge. So he looks up the word in his own uh, uh, lexicon, his own vocabulary, finds the category, and then applies that category to the objects in the world in order to find back the topic that the speaker has chosen. And so afterwards, uh, when, as you saw, the, the, the here is pointing, the speaker looks whether it's to the right object. And if that's the case, he will say yes. Otherwise, he will say no, and then give feedback by pointing to the other object. That's indeed the, the topic he had in mind. So this is sort of the normal game. Now, then we also implement uh, this, this, these repair strategies which is what happens when something goes wrong. And so, for example, when the speaker cannot find a distinctive category, then there's a repair strategy uh, process which becomes active in the head of this robot, which will create a new category, for example, by adding a, a distinction that was not yet in the inventory. And the same thing, if there's no word yet, a process becomes active that will create a new word. The here also has a repair strategy, you know, that if no word yet, it will ask the speaker and then store it. Or if, um, uh, if the, the category, there's no category yet, he will try to reconstruct the category and then store that in his uh, memory. And so when we do an experiment, uh, this is for color naming, uh, with two robots playing this kind of game and an implementation of this strategy, then we can do scientific experiments and resulting in uh, graphs like this one. And so what you see on this plot is this is the number of games that the agents have been playing. So this is game 1000. And you see this is a population of five agents. And we plot on, on here, this is the success in communication that the agents have. And these agents, this population starts without any words, without any categories. And of course, then in the beginning, they don't have any success, right? And so, but after a while, you see that very quickly, they reach uh, more than 95% uh, success. Success means that the speaker agrees that this is the topic that he had in mind. So a kind of miracle has happened here because starting from no lexicon and no inventory of categories, the speaker in here and, and the, this group of agents arrived at a shared communication system that they could use successfully to communicate. You also see another measure here is the number of categories uh, and the number of words they have. And this is the green uh, graph here is showing the variation in the population. Because in the beginning there's a lot of variation uh, speaker and here, they don't yet agree, but after a while, they, they align more and more their categories and their words. And you can also see that in, in this particular graph here, which is uh, uh, showing here after 1,000 games, that these are the different prototypes for the words that the agents have. And you see the colors are not yet really that similar. Okay, but if we look after 2,500 games, Again, this is for every agent. These are the prototypes that the agents have for every uh, color word. And you see that they have become a lot more similar. So there's a convergence of categories and words within this uh, population uh, progressively as they are playing these uh, language games. And here is another way to visualize uh, what is going on in the head of one of these agents. So what you see here is, is uh, the different words, like here the blue boxes are examples of words. 
And the, uh, these things are the, the categories of these agents, how they recognize the, the words in the reality. And you see that in the beginning it's a little bit messy, but after a while there is more and more structure in the, in the brain of this particular robot because there's a more systematic way of relating words uh, to their meanings. And as the, uh, this agent is playing more and more games, there's already, as you can see here, almost 900 games that uh, he played, you see that this uh, memory of words and categories becomes more stable, but it's also now and then there's a reorganization of this memory going on because maybe new objects came in or a new agent entered into the population and as a result a new invention was made and so the other agents had to adapt to it. So let me now conclude here. Um, what we have been doing is, is to try and understand uh, how representations are made. Now we focused on language, but language is a, a special case actually of making representations. You can also make drawings or gestures or movies or other kinds of representations. And why is it so important? Well, because as I tried to show, making of representations is a kind of motor. It's, it's a key for creating new meanings and is a, also the key for sharing meanings. Because when we talk with each other, we can only communicate if we actually, if speaker and hear align their meanings, align their uh, representations. I also believe that um, robots when we want to make really intelligent robots, uh, that this is only going to be possible if we understand this process, how language and meaning emerge in situated embodied interactions. In other words, we cannot just put language in the robot. Well, we can, but we would not learn something fundamental about um, meaning, about language, and about intelligence. And as you could see, the, uh, by doing these experiments, we can deconstruct, we can unpack the processes that are involved in language and meaning, and that we do systematic experiments and also generate new technologies that we could use for new forms of interaction between uh, humans and machines. <laughs>